Welcome back. Today is the Bible study for Friday, April 24th. Thank you for joining me as we continue our work in the gospel according to Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And today we'll be taking a look at 5, 31 and following. These are some of the more difficult verses for us to understand and to deal with in our modern context. And why? Well, let me read them. Uh, again, 531 and following. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Um, Divorce is a reality of modern life. <laughs> Evidently, is a reality of Jesus' day, too. Uh, I have two brothers who are divorced and remarried. Chances are you have somebody in your family who has been divorced. Maybe you yourself have been divorced, and you've read these words, and you think, what on earth does that mean? Uh, well, to get to the heart of this, we need to understand what divorce was like in Jesus' day. It was very different than it was is in our day. Uh, it's, again, never divorce is always a difficult, hard thing, almost always. So in Jesus' day, it certainly was hard and difficult, uh, particularly for the woman in the relationship. It, the way it worked um, under the rules and laws uh, as established was that a man could divorce his wife for pretty much any reason. All he had to do was write out why. It didn't really have to be anything substan substantial. It just had to be on a whim. A man could come in and say, I don't want to be married to you any longer. He write out a certificate of divorce. Didn't have to go to an attorney. Didn't have to go to court. Just write out few words, hand her the piece of paper and say, okay, you're no longer mine. You're no longer divorced. And, and I use that word, you're no longer mine, because the women were treated more as property. They certainly weren't treated as equal partners in any aspect of life, and in particular, not in marriage. So a woman could find herself put out on the street at the whim of her husband. And what was to become of her? Many of the women who received these certificates of divorce, they weren't a, they didn't get remarried many of them ended up in prostitution so there was no social safety net the idea of divorce in Jesus's day was much closer to what we would call abandonment just I'm done and then um, the woman's life was essentially downhill from there and so that's part of that, that divorce has become a mean and ugly thing in that way. Again, this is about relationships, about how we treat each other, about how we manage to be in relationship with each other. And the way that divorce was used in Jesus' day was tragic. Um, now, does this mean that um, as you read this, that, that there's no room for divorce? Well, divorce isn't something I think that... God ever desires for people. Um, I think it, it's a hard thing. And I, I know people, and, and in our culture, I, I personally don't know anyone who's gone through a divorce that it wasn't, that it was careless, that it was, um, maybe that's not the right word, that it was done without pain or hurt. Uh, certainly the way that men could divorce women could be done in an arbitrary way that i I mean, that may happen. There may be divorces of convenience, but those seem to happen between movie stars uh, and celebrities. The real people I've known who've gone through real divorces have not done so lightly. Uh, they've done so with a lot of gravity and a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. I've even seen marriages where a divorce was probably the best option because of the, the pain within the marriage, within even... I've, I've counseled women who were in abusive situations. Uh, and so if the idea is to be in the best possible relationship, then we have to think about that and what, what Jesus' intention is about honoring those relationships. Again, this is, this is heavy. Um, this, this pushes a lot of buttons. Um, 
ideally, when people get married, they would stay married. I, I want to read you a few things about um, about what, again, what Thomas Long says in his commentary. He, he says this, the main point, however, is that Jesus allows no room for the practice of divorce in a culture, again, back in his time, where divorce is an assault on the value of persons, an abuse of power, and a trivializing of faithful commitments. Um, all right, so again, don't take your marriage lightly. Don't trivialize it. Um, and then Long goes on to say, some people, to be sure, casually leave their marriages. Most divorced people, however, have left their marriages because to the best of their ability to see uh, they did what they had to do. And so what does the words of Jesus mean to these people? Okay, I, I don't normally read to you, but he says it so much better than I possibly can. So, so please stick with me. We need to first acknowledge that the word divorce in the Sermon on the Mount does not mean exactly the word of what the word divorce means today. In the first century world, divorce was similar to what we would call abandonment. Someone simply walked out, or more likely threw the woman out, with little ceremony. In societies where the church has been a major factor, divorce laws have been changed to make abandonment illegal. In other words, most contemporary divorce laws have been affected to some degree by the Sermon on the Mount. I think find that interesting that Jesus' teachings do affect our modern understanding of law. The most important need, though, is to discern what lies at the heart of Jesus' words. Just as Jesus discerned what lay at the heart of the Mosaic law. Marriage is intended to be a communion between two people that expresses in their mutual fidelity the faithfulness of God. It's intended to be a place of safety, nurture, and honor for persons. In Jesus' day, the customs and practices of divorce were a direct assault on those values. And then Long goes on to write, and, and I ask you just to hang in there with me on this one. Today, ironically, a hopelessly broken marriage can itself sometimes be such an assault. A marriage can become distorted. It can betray its intended purposes and become a place where people are in physical or mental danger, where they are tragically dishonest and mutually destructive. Jesus' word about divorce was spoken to preserve the value of the people involved in marriages. When a marriage becomes the very arena where people are destroying each other, we should ask, how can the safety, nurture, and honor of the marriage partners best be preserved? This will mean viewing with compassion the people and their relationship, not merely defend, defending the institution of marriage as such. Marriage was made for humanity, not humanity for marriage. Um, again, this is hard. Um, it, it, it gets to the heart of our relationships with each other, which is why it's so important in our marriages that we have Christ be at the heart of it, that we relate to each other through who we are in Jesus. Uh, and that's where our hope comes from and where our hope of maintaining our marriages come from. Again, this is... Uh, Lots of people have lots of different opinions about this. My hope and prayer is that no one would ever get divorced. But I also know that's not the reality of the world we live in. What I do know is that no matter what brokenness we may experience personally, there is life on the other side. There is forgiveness. There is rebirth. There is a new tomorrow. And so if you're watching this out there and you're in a place where maybe you've gone through a divorce or maybe you're going through a divorce, just know that God's love extends to you especially. Uh, God's care is there for you and that God can and will and wants to lead you to a new and better day. If you're in a place where you're struggling in your marriage, do everything you can to faithfully honor the person you're in the marriage with and work out your marriage as best you can to honor God and trust that God will get you to the right place. Uh, so I've, I've heard of times where pastors have counseled women to stay in abusive marriages to the detriment of the woman and the children, and I don't think that's what God intends. 
Uh, I don't think that's what God, Jesus is talking about when he talks about how we are supposed to have the right relationships with each other. Um, I don't think Jesus desires for anyone to be abused just for the sake of maintaining a marriage. Um, I do think Jesus desires transformation and love. And, and the thing is, if we live into the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and then our marriages are solid, they are strong, and they have a they have do have a biblical basis upon which we can build a good and lasting and loving relationship. Um, then Jesus goes on to uh, offer this in five thirty three. Again, you have heard that it was said in those ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows that you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven or by its throne of God or by the earth for its footstool or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes or no be no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the kind of people he wants us to be. The kind of people who don't need to say, oh, I promise on my mother's grave or I swear by my children's lives. Um, no, he wants us to have the kind of character where we just simply do what we say we will do. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I will do it. If I... My yes will be yes, and my no will be no. That That's character. Um, we live in a time where we get lied to a lot. Uh, and what does it mean? I mean, to have the kind of character where your word can be trusted, and you don't have to go into hyperbolic statements um, like, you know, if, if, I, if I don't do this, then I'm going to whatever, you know. You don't have to swear by anything. You just have to say yes or no and be able to trust that the yes or the no is exactly what will happen. Um, I mean, what, what would the world look like if people just stopped lying? If they stopped telling things that weren't true and you could trust somebody's word? Maybe you know somebody like that. I hope you do. I hope you know plenty of people in this congregation that are exactly like that because that's who we're all supposed to be. When someone says yes to you, they're telling you the truth. When they say no to you, they're telling you the truth. Um, and that you can trust that. That's the kind of character Jesus wants us to have. Not the, not to, I mean, is that too much to ask that we don't lie to each other? So can we live into this? Yeah, we really can. But it takes the right kind of character. And how do we get that character? By being shaped by who Jesus is and by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that renews our hearts, our minds, our very souls to make us into the people that Christ desires us to be. So uh, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And see if that doesn't work out better for you in the long run. So that's our end of our studies for this week. Thank you for joining me and look forward to catching up with you again starting on Monday. God bless you and have a great weekend. Thank you.